as a child, I was absolutely fascinated by the First World War. And at school, I'd be encouraged to read all of the, the famous First World War poets, so people like um, Owen and Sassoon and Graves and Rosenberg and all of those writers. And I'd read pretty much everything in our school library. And I don't know quite how it happened, but there was a copy of, in parenthesis, in this little school library. I have no idea how on earth it got there. And I picked it up and started to try to read it. It was such a strong, visceral, visual recreation of the world of the First World War that was quite unlike anything I had ever come across before. T.S. Eliot, Auden, Yeats all believed that, in parenthesis, was the pinnacle of uh, First World War writing. In fact, I think it was Auden that said something along the lines of, David Jones has done for the British and the Germans what Homer did for the Greeks and the Trojans. In parenthesis, marked the beginning of his poetic career and it was published in 1937 and he began work on it in about 1928. But prior to that, um, he was a very accomplished visual artist and he thought of himself purely as a visual artist. And in fact, in parenthesis began as a series of drawings about the First World War, which he started to put a little bit of text with. And then over the course of the genesis of the, of the work, the text just started to blossom and take over and the pictorial images dropped away until finally it was left with uh, a work of pure poetry. I have only tried to make a shape in words, using as data the complex of sights, sounds, fears, hopes, apprehensions, smells, things exterior and interior. The story is set during World War I. It's a very simple story, one that probably most people are familiar with, and that is that young men, in this case our platoon, pretty much all of them meet their death except John Ball who like the bard the singer is remains to tell his story to sing his song running alongside the temporal real world of life in the trenches you know the, the usual first world war experiences we have this parallel universe it's, a, it's an alternate world in which uh, a world war one soldier might suddenly morph into uh, knights seeking the grail, or soldiers at Cressy, or ancient warriors from Britonic times. David Jones as an artist, but also by extension John Ball as the experiencer, is always looking through the ordinary, piercing that veil, and seeing the extraordinary, and experiencing the extraordinary. It's very interesting when you look at David Jones' art in this period, because his visual art, that is exactly what he's seeking for this sense that, um, in a way, the physical reality of the world is how we all have used as a sort of gateway through to more spiritual dimensions. It's extremely sonorous, mellifluous, it's very musical. It has that sort of Celtic quality of musicality. Um, and I think that's what drew us to the idea of um, setting it as an opera. Dark balks sundered, bare down, beat down, a hurtle through the fractured growings green. Pile high and heaped diversity. Brass break, bow break the backs of them. Every bone of the white wounded who wait patiently, looking toward that hope. For the feet of the carrier's long coming, bringing palanquins to spread worshipful beds for heroes. David Jones' own approach to creativity in the making of art was very eclectic, very explorative, quintessentially sort of modernist really. He just wanted to find the right method, the right means, the right materials in order to communicate what he wanted to express. I think we like to feel that if, if David Jones were here now, sitting here, he'd be very supportive and very intrigued as if saying, yeah, I wonder and making an opera out of in parentheses that's a, that's a that's a strange interesting idea i'm fascinated to see what comes of it and therefore that he would be hopefully smiling ruefully while he watched